So our last speaker for this session is Dr. Brenda McCowan, who's a professor of population health and reproduction here at the UC Davis School of Veterinary Medicine. She's also the director of the Animal Behavior Laboratory for Welfare and Conservation. Brenda's work focuses on behavioral biology and ecology with a real emphasis on both basic and applied research aspects related to animal behavior and communication, all with the goal of enhancing wildlife health um, as well as conservation. Um, she's also at the front edge of research trying to bring network methods into analyzing complex social phenomenon in primatology, um, as well as developing new method, new, new network-based methods, uh, which are really exciting, which she's going to be talking to us about today in her talk, Connections Matter. So thank you, Brenda. Thank you, Meg, and um, thank you for inviting me to speak here today. Um, this is a very exciting uh, uh, conference to be a part of. Um, so my, my original title had a subtitle of Social Network Stability in Health in Rhesus Macaques, um, but I decided that I should probably uh, hone this down to something a little bit more uh, related to decision making, and so I'm gonna focus my attention on the, the work that we've done under that broader category on group cohesion and collapse in rhesus macaque societies. And um, I'm gonna be talking about a series of studies that my research team and I have done over the last several years looking at the stability of social groups, um, of large captive social groups at the California National Primate Research Center. And we've been doing this work in part to be able to develop new methods for detecting instabilities in social groups so that we might increase the welfare and health, the health welfare and management of these non-human primates. But we're also interested in the, the, the drivers and the mechanisms that, aff that affect stability in social groups such that we can look at, again, at being able to identify, uh, detect, and prevent uh, instabilities in a number of different kinds of systems, uh, biological systems, other social systems, uh, even societal systems. And to, to sort of emphasize this point, um, we can look at two very powerful uh, uh, inst instability systems, systems that had instabilities. If we look at the polarization, for example, of um, the U.S. House of Representatives over time from 1949 to 2011, we see that there's a collapse in this structure of bipartisan voting um, um, across uh, parties. Uh, and um, it's, we want to understand the processes by which these kinds of things occur. And of course, we all remember the 2008 um, uh, global uh, financial collapse that, again, that we, we can determine ways in which that we can identify these kinds of problems, we can go ahead and prevent them. So my team and I have developed a, a sort of a, a conceptual framework to, to begin to understand how we can look at uh, processes of stability in social systems. And we, I, we think of it as the drivers, including things like in our non-human primate model, demographics such as age, si size, and uh, sex and size, and you know, sort of group composition, kinship included in that as well, but also kinship dynamics, um, how that match line structure is actually um, is actually formed and also how much of uh, unrelated membership is contributing to these dynamics. And also the collection of individual attributes, which includes past experience such as rearing, current experience, um, and something that we call biobehavioral organization, which includes things like personality and other aspects of individual differences. So if we think of those as the drivers um, that affect different kinds of networks or the structures of social systems, um, we can begin to look at uh, these networks in relationship to how key they are in a, particular, um, in a particular social system, as well as how different networks correspond to one another. And in our non-human primate example, we were talking, we'll be talking about status signaling networks and its relationship to aggression networks. Uh, and then we also are interested in this notion of certainty in networks and in our rhesus macaque model, we're talking about dominance probabilities. So all of these, in turn, these structural aspects of, of uh, social systems drive whether or not robustness to mechanisms such as conflict intervention, um, policing, or c conflict resolution can operate to stabilize systems. And so we're interested in this, in this entire system as a whole. So why would we study rhesus macaques in, 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 for, for, start, for looking at these kinds of, of, of um, issues and looking at the processes underlying stability in social systems? Well, it turns out that rhesus macaques are a lot like humans. Um, they are a weed species like we are. They live um, 
throughout, uh, have a wide distribution throughout South and Southeast Asia, and in fact, uh, are, are cause a lot of problems with respect to human, um, human monkey conflict in a number of those, of those countries. Um, they have a very complex social structure. They're comprised of, of large multi-male, multi-female groups that, uh, where females are philopatric and the males disperse. Um, the females inherit their rank from their mother, and there's a, a quite a clear dominance hierarchy in, in rhesus and macaque society. And the California National Primate Research Center has um, 24 enclosures of, of groups, uh, anywhere from 80 to uh, 200 animals per enclosure in these very complex social systems that we're able to study. Uh, and um, they live in these half acre enclosures and we have natural variability in the stability of these groups. So some of these groups are stable and some of these groups are not stable. So here's an example of what our what field enclosures look like, uh, uh, these half acre field enclosures with all these different animals and the kinds of structures that they have um, in those enclosures. So for the groups that I'm gonna be talking about today, we actually study two different kinds of groups, observing them slightly differently from, one, from one, each other. Um, in group A, we have uh, three groups which we study for a long period of time, for over a year, or close to a year of study. Uh, and one of those groups actually socially collapsed in April 2011 after a sh uh, short observation period. Uh, so we have that kind of a collapse. And when, I'm t when I say a social collapse, I mean a, what we call a cage war. We literally have to disband the entire cage and, 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 um, and uh, reform a new cage as a result of that. The second set of groups we studied uh, for uh, shorter periods of time, and we have a, a couple of different groups there, where we, after, during the time that we were observing them, we, we saw a social collapse. So this is the kinds of, of groups that we um, observe. When we observe these groups, we're looking at multiple different kinds of networks. So we have many different kinds of behavioral networks that we're looking at, including aggression and grooming, um, subordination networks, and conflict intervention networks, among others, alliance networks. Uh, and we collect these data uh, with observers uh, cage side uh, to collect the interactions between individuals in order to, to develop these networks. And what I'm gonna focus on today due to lack of time instead of the entire picture is I'm just gonna talk a little bit about what we've done looking at the, our keystone networks, which are status signaling, status signaling networks, as well as looking at our, uh, the correspondence between multiple networks, and in this particular case, two networks, aggression and status signaling. So let's first start with talking about our keystone network, the status signaling network, so you have an idea of what this is comprised of. So macaques produce um, a, 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 a behavior called a silent bared teeth display, uh, use it as a signal, which is homologous to the human smile, as a, as a, a means of um, displaying subordination to others in the social group. And um, it, what's interesting about these, these um, silent bared silent bare teeth space, or SBTs, is that there are many different types. And one is a type that is produced in peaceful contexts, which is a formal signal of subordination, um, indicating that another animal is dominant to you. And what's also interesting about these, these SBTs is that th these animals seem to have a consensus of subordination. That is, there's a collective, almost a collective deci decision-making process, almost kind of analogous to voting that's going on with these SBTs, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, to, uh, Soon. I, I want to emphasize that sort of that con consensus um, uh, idea because one of the things that we see with these SBT networks is that there are no circular relationships with them. They are completely transitive. That is, they only go in one direction, up, in, up it, and is related to dominance. So you only see one, you do never see one individual that gives um, an SBT to another individual. That, that same individual giving an SBT back. And so it, it's a very structured, highly structured, highly hierarchical, uh, complex network uh, among these individuals. And here's an example of a stable SBT keystone network um, uh, in one of our groups. What you'll note here is that it's very hierarchical, it's very complex in its connections, it's multi-layered, um, and it has a number of indirect paths as well. So I'm just giving you some examples of some of these stable um, SBT networks that we see in our groups. And what we see what happens in unstable groups, again, these get right before a collapse, as I described earlier, is that we see that th this structure um, disappears. 
So we see that the hierarch hierarchical structure of the unstable group in 2011, same group, uh, when it was stable in 2009, completely disappears. Um, we have fewer nodes that are involved in the SBT network, and we have fewer, indi fewer indirect paths that are connecting these individuals. As an example of another group that show was unstable, um, we see the similar kind of pattern. So it turns out that, that the, these SBT networks, it's the hierarchical, complexly connected, multi-tiered, uh, multi uh, indirect pathways is extremely important to stability in these, in these, um, in this species. So in summary, with respect to the SBT network and are looking at our Keystone network, um, stable groups tend to show fully connected SBT networks that have multi-level structure and more long indirect uh, signaling pathways, whereas our unstable groups show less connectivity and SBT networks, loss of nodes multi and multi-level structure, and a loss of those indirect signaling pathways. And we're currently be, um, beginning to quantify this so that we can look at you know, sort of significant changes, uh, not just qualitative changes in networks. Okay, so what about looking at multiple networks and their correspondence between them? Um, we, are, like, we are developed a new um, network technique called joint network modeling that um, allows us to model the interrelationship between two or more networks. Uh, currently, we are modeling two networks, but we're working on modeling three networks simultaneously. Uh, and in, the, in this case, we're going to be talking about uh, these two networks, the, oh, whoops, the aggression... Something happened. <laughs> there we go. The, um, the aggression network and our status networks and how they actually correspond to each other. The way that we do this um, is we have, you know, behaviors can be, are directed and can be directed to one to the other or, or vice versa. And so in our aggression, you can either have animal A aggressing animal B or animal B, animal B aggressing animal A, or you can have animal A giving uh, status signaling status signals to animal B or the other way around. So we have basically four opportunities for a directed relationship between these, these individuals. Um, in the simplest case, what we have is, uh, is, the, is no interaction, that you have nothing moving between individuals. And then we have nine other possible um, scenarios in which you can either have only a, a bi-directional aggression, um, or you can have bi, at the bottom here, you can have bi-directional aggression and bi-directional signaling. Just to give you, um, just to give you a, an example, this re this represents the 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 the, uh, the four letter code for um, the different kinds of interactions that you can have. So you basically have four four I'm sorry ten different types of interactions that can occur between dyads. And what we f what we can do is we can take those ten intera interaction between dyads, and we can look at the, t the number of, of um, dyads that we would expect to show those interactions based upon the probability of the behavior to begin with, right? So this, we can get an expected value that these two networks are completely independent of each other. And then we can compare that to what we see actually occurring in these groups. Um, so we, we, and what we can get is a chi-square value that tells us how much, um, how often you expect to see this in, I'm sorry, how often you observe something um, uh, in relationship to how often you expect, you're expected to see it, and that could be either being, more, being um, more expected or less expected. And if you look um, at the, the column that you see of the chi-square, you see there's a lot of variation, uh, some of which is very small uh, in terms of the chi-square, which means that you're meeting expectations, and some that are very high, which means that the expectation is not being met. And if you look at this particular um, comparison of two networks in a group, uh, you find that these two networks are not independent. Okay. okay. So once we have that, that kind of information, what we can do is we can begin to tweak the model, the null model being inter independence, and we can provide, we can be, begin to put constraints onto this model in order to see where the, where, um, which aspects of the uh, interactions are important to these animals. So we can take a function one, for example, so we first have the, uh, 
just the, uh, the chi-square value that is the um, null model, the ind independence. And then we, we can take a, a constraint function and with, like for example, that two-way aggression is really rare and we can see how, that, how the chi-square value changes as a result of that. And as the chi-square value changes or, or dives in this particular case, the more important that particular function is, okay? So we can do that for all of these different functions. Function uh, one being two-way aggressive is rare. Function two being two-way status signaling is rare. And function three is that ag aggression and status uh, are in opposite directions of each other. So what happens when we um, look at this kind of um, model with respect to stable and unstable groups? Well, what we see is that in stable groups, again, this is the total chi-square on the y-axis and the constraint functions on the x-axis, we can see that in the stable groups over looking at various time points of uh, in instability is that we see the stable groups show um, that, uh, that, uh, that aggression, um, that, that bi bidirectional regression is rare, that status signaling, uh, uh, um, bidirectional status signaling is rare, but that the, uh, the relationship between the opposite pathways of aggression and status is actually quite important. Okay, so that's what that's showing. And we see that in all of these stable social groups. Well, what do we see in those unstable social groups? We see that that, 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 that relationship change. First, we see a, a, an increase in the importance of bidirectional, um, a bidirectional aggression. And, but, and we also, so that's what we see in these groups. This group actually recovered um, temporarily and then sh also uh, fell apart again in, in, during this unstable period. Uh, and then we also see um, a, a decoupling of the um, aggression status signaling opposite um, interaction. So those are just sort of two different modes in which we can see the instabilities occurring. So in summary, um, stable groups show many more um, aggression status dyads than expected uh, in the opposite direction um, and as much bidirectional aggression as expected. Uh, but in the unstable groups, we see more bidirectional aggression and um, we see a loss of this aggression status interdependence. So in summary, um, we think that we've found a couple of different ways in which we can identify and, and perhaps use this information to, to, um, to predict when social collapse is going to occur, at least in our macaque social groups. That may, and these kinds of concepts might be able to be used in other, other systems. Um, identification of keystone networks that are extremely important to the stability of a social system. Uh, and in our case, this is the SPT network and Rhesus Macaque Society. They are used to maintain stable social groups and may be used to anticipate social collapse, as I've just said, be because we can look at this hierarchical and transitive structure and the indirect pathways. And we can also uh, identify key social uh, roles that individuals play as a result of, of looking at these kinds of networks because it, it's indeed it is the conflict interveners that receive most of these kinds of signals um, in these networks. And so we can identify those individuals to make sure that we have the right kind of individuals in, in the appropriate positions. And joint net network modeling um, is, a, is, a very, uh, uh, is a wonderful approach because um, a powerful approach because it, it's applicable to detecting instability in just about any kind of, of, of complex system that has multiple networks. Uh, for example, uh, we already talked about social systems and behavioral networks, but it could be used to look at ecosystem networks and, of course, financial system uh, banking networks, um, as we suggest in one of our publications. And we can track um, the interconnections across networks to track stability in order to maybe intervene when these kinds of systems are, are becoming, are starting to collapse. So um, in summary, we, we think that these are useful models and that our nine human primate model are um, to develop the kind of tools to identify and predict and prevent social system, uh, system prevent system, systemic collapse in a variety of different kinds of human and non-human systems and perhaps could, could be used to, to model the kinds of systems that we talked earlier that come from human societies. And with that, I will um, just acknowledge the several people that are involved in the research, including our, our um, wonderful observation team, um, our colleagues, and our funding sources. Thank you. <laughs>